All right, so I'm going to talk about the uh, prediction of thermally induced explosive concrete spalling and normal weight concrete under high intensity fire exposure. This is going to be somewhere around ASTM E1529, about 85% of that for the for most of the exposures. And if we want to get into that a little later, I have a, an additional slide. But my name is Eric Carlton, PhD uh, candidate at Lehigh University. My dissertation advisors are uh, Dr. Spencer Quill and Dr. Clay Nido. Uh, so I'm going to start this off with a, a, a brief introduction. Um, we're going to get into the analytical prediction methodology, um, then I'm going to go through a couple different iterations on this, so I'm going to kind of work you through uh, multiple layers of detail here, and if we still have time, I'll get into questions, uh, but apologize, apologies uh, up front, uh, this is probably going to go relatively quick, um, but um, I, I wanted to show what the behavior is first, um, so, so I'm going to go ahead and start this video here. Go on. There we go. So I've got a, um, a concrete specimen loaded in here. Um, and we've got these two vice beams here on the bottom and top. The actual load jacks are underneath and they're, they're putting this in compression. You want to train your eyes here on the orange square. Uh, that's oh, oh, there we go. All right, shut it down. So, so that's the, uh, that, it was one of the first uh, specimens that we got to, to spall. We had some undergraduates that hadn't seen it before. Um, but you can see here, we've got a, a, a really large amount of material that has, has uh, explosively uh, spalled off the, the front face there. And what's that doing is it's, um, it's diminishing the cross-sectional area and we're exposing deeper material to direct heating. Um, if, if, there's, uh, if, if it's deep enough, you can also expose uh, the steel reinforcing, which is more, more thermally sensitive than the concrete itself. So it's something that we're really kind of concerned with. Um, but, but as you can see, it's, it's not a, a light um, sloughing off of material. This is a large uh, kind of unexpected bang. Uh, the other folks that have tested similarly to this, um, they have noted that this doesn't really happen after 20 minutes. In our experimentation with these blocks, um, we weren't seeing anything past nine minutes. Uh, so this is something that happens really early on and it's due to really uh, extreme thermal heating uh, gradients. But, but kind of talking about this generally speaking, so if I have my cross section here, we have an initial moisture content, uh, con um, initial moisture condition occurring with it. Our concrete strength is, is gonna be pretty much, you know, consistent across the cross section. That's both tensile and compressive. If we put a, a uniformly distributed uh, axial load there uh, through stress distribution like this on the top and keep the temperature at ambient, we're going to end up having a, a pore pressure somewhere around here that's that's like ambient condition. Um, and if we take a look at uh, at, at a little uh, permeable void space here, um, we, we effectively have some portion of the of the permeable void that's going to have liquid water, and then another portion of it is going to have um, saturated vapor uh, or, or excuse me uh, water vapor uh, in, in the rest of that void. Now, concrete is typically two orders of magnitude more permeable for gas than it is for liquid, and this becomes a, a little more important as we start to do things like apply heating to it. So, I'm doing a single sided heating scenario here. Uh, we introduce this the really steep uh, temperature gradient. Um, that's going to introduce this reduction in concrete strength, both tensile and, compa and, and um, compressive, and that's going to change our, our stress profile. Um, this is just a snapshot in time, but through thermal elongation, we're going to end up um, drawing a little bit more uh, a stress to those elongating um, you know, areas of the cross section. Um, until we get to, to a softening level, and we'll talk a little bit more about softening on as we go forward. But in effect, we end up getting a drying region, uh, a, a saturated wet region, and then um, the, the rest of the initial moisture content for the rest of the cross section here. So if we look at that same um, pore pressure, or excuse me, that same uh, permeable void space, we see that we're starting, you know, we're in a, an area where we're collecting water vapor from, in the, from the drying section is starting to collect it at temperatures that allow condensation. So we start to fill those voids up. And with the, the difference in permeability for gas and, and liquid water, we end up generating some pressure. And so typically what we've seen with the experimental record is that we, we, we get this, um, this pressure peak that, that occurs. And it's typically somewhere between the, the boundary of the, of the wet and the drying region. And, and what we've seen in experimentation, I showed in that video, is that if you get the right thermal uh, uh, gradient through there, the right uh, uh, reduction in strength and pore pressure development, that you'll develop a spalling condition if it happens in the right time at the right depth in the concrete section. So, so the goal of this is to try to provide some way for practitioners to, to predict where this is under these types of, of, um, of conditions. So we've de developed a model. And what we'd like this to do is that anybody that, any finite element anal method analysis that includes thermal effects can be used. So we just need to get a, a temperature analysis output. So we need a, a temperature time history. And then we need a, a mechanical analysis that accounts for that temperature. 
um, and, and take those two things out. Um, and we have a numerical computational process to then predict the spalling um, behavior. Uh, so this is kind of what it looks like. We have our, our initial structural con uh, condition. Uh, we generate our temperature analysis that has the time history output. Um, then we have a mechanical analysis where we need to get our, I, I, I'm going to call it a, a stress mechanical, but it's, a, it's a, the summation of the thermal stress as well as the loading stresses. Um, the, the strain output and the tangent modulus, um, those two um, the sets of histories, uh, we then move into our small prediction analysis where we make a generalization for pore stress. We evaluate um, tensile capacity check to, to establish what a spalled section or a crack section is. And then we move into a stability check that allows us to then uh, evaluate what's going on mechanically in that spalled region or potentially spalled region and to see whether or not it's stabilized where no spalling occurs or if it's destabilizing, we will have a spalling event. Um, so I'm going to go back and start over again here. Um, so bear with me. Um, so here, here we've got some, some fibers that we've established in this uh, for a greater section where effectively, you know, let's assume these are like 16th of an inch. We're exposing it single sided. We, we get our temperature um, uh, uh, gradient through the, this, the, um, through the thickness. Uh, we're starting to change our stress profile. We're getting some, some elevated stresses towards the, the, the heated uh, fibers. And uh, we, we're seeing a reduction in our concrete strength, and we've developed this pore pressure. Now, what, what we've seen in the experimental record is that um, folks that are actually measuring uh, pore, pore pressures in concrete that are that's at elevated temperatures typically follows the saturated vapor pressure um, curve that you can develop from steam tables. And so what we did is we, we co-opted this in to make a, a gross simplification on, on the pore stress. We're not accounting for the changes in permeability. We're not accounting for the changes in, in phase. Um, and we're not we're not doing mass loss for 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 vapor escaping out of the heat. Um, so um, we we modify we we take that that poor or that saturated vapor pressure and we modify that with a BO tensor to then get what we're seeing for pore stress in the concrete. Um, but we limit that by the te the, the temperature reduced uh, tensile capacity of the concrete in each one of the fibers. Now we're doing this numerically, so we're shifting all these. Uh, each fiber has its own independent value, right? So it has its own particular temperature, its own concrete strength, its own pore pressure, and, and that goes for all of those um, fibers that's in there. And we we start to evaluate each one of those fibers again for um, for its tensile capacity. So I'm using the Zukov um, Lou equation here. Zukov uh, used a one degree energy analysis to develop his equation and, and Lou uh, and Zurich for his PhD dissertation refine the coefficients on that. But in effect, it's it's the pore pressure and as well as the mechanical stress, which is the uh, the thermal and, and loading stresses combination compared to that tensile capacity uh, reduced by um, re reduced by temperature. And it's in this particular range from experimentation that, that Lou developed. So we use the same um, the same equation. Um, and, and let's say that we we get a spall condition at at, at um, at five or seven here. So this is defining our spalled section, our crack section. So from, from the heated face all the way out to and including that, that spall condition satisfying fiber, we're dictating as the crack section, the spalled section. So we move on to evaluating the stability within this. And this is where we kind of differ from the, these other researchers, these other methods. Um, so we're taking the mechanical output uh, a mechanical analysis output, and we're, we're developing a secant modulus. Um, so we're taking that, that thermal and, and, and loading stress, the as I'm calling it, the mechanical stress, and we're dividing that by the strain. However, the total strain needs to have the creep removed for it. That allows us to do comparisons between the, um, the fibers, uh, irrespective of temperature. They all have different temperatures, and we need to be able to remove that creep so that it's like for like comparison. But in effect, what we're doing is we're, we're we're setting a, um, a stiffness for each one of these fibers and, and a grand, you know, an equivalent uh, uh, stiffness for the entire section. And that allows us to find the center of stiffness. This is something that was developed in, for steel sections on columns by uh, Marie, Marie Garlock and, and Spencer Quill um, at, at Princeton 2007 is, is, is the paper where they talk about this, but we've, we've changed the method over from a steel um, material to, to concrete. And, and part of that was taking the, the uh, creep strain out of the, out of the, out of the equation. Um, but let, let's say this is where our, our center of stiffness uh, for the crack section it, it, it exists. We now need to uh, evaluate what this thermal moment. So it's the stress um, uh, uh, summation about that center of stiffness. Um, we also found from experimentation that we needed to have a minimum um, compressive stress um, in, in relation to the, um, the temperature reduced compressive capacity of each fiber uh, averaged across the section as well. But um, you know, looking at this from a stabilizing condition, if our moment is like this, and we have uh, all of the sections put in bearing, uh, put in, in bending so that they're bearing on the greater section, this is a stabilizing moment. 
um, and we will not get a spalling event. Or if we don't meet this threshold for our, our stress to capacity ratio that, we, that we've pulled out, um, it, it is a stabilized section. We do not have spalling. Um, conversely, if we look at a destabilizing condition, um, we need to um, change our, our stress profile. So if we have something where softening gets uh, uh, starts to begin on that the, the most heat exposed uh, uh, surfaces, we, we get this softening in here. It changes our stress distribution, which in turn changes the thermal induced moment. It changes the bending uh, out so that we're now bending the, um, the, the fibers towards the heated face. Um, and that gives us a destabilizing moment. If that occurs and we also meet that minimum threshold for the, the stress to compressive capacity, um, we have a destabilized section and spalling occurs. Um, so now I'm gonna run into a, a, a validation case. So this is a normal weight concrete specimen. It was at 3.4% moisture content, 13.3 um, grams per meter cubed of um, uh, actual vapor density. Um, I, I've got the, the, the um, uh, standard units on here, but in effect, it's just normal weight concrete between about 5,000, 6,000 uh, PSI concrete. Um, I've got the thermal um, values in there from it, but I'm just trying to show you this. This isn't anything special. This is just a normal mix. Uh, we got this from a, a local supplier. Um, kind of important on here is that our axial load was at 13.34% of the nominal compressive stress or strength of the concrete and spalling occurred in this specimen at 228 seconds and 10 millimeters of depth. So kind of keep those numbers in mind, 228 seconds and 10 millimeters of depth. Um, here's our structural condition. The, the specimens were 24 inches tall, 18 inches wide, six inches deep. Uh, we were modeling the, the heated cross section on this. So with a one inch by six inch section, the fibers are effectively a, a 16th of an inch. Uh, so we have 97 of them. Uh, we took the temperature history from embedded thermal couples in that region. Um, this is just showing you uh, the, the colors are through time and we had discrete points on there. So there was four thermal couples, one at the, the, the heated face, a quarter inch, half inch and one inch. And we used a, a, an interpolation function to, to give us you know, the values for all 97 um, or, uh, fibers throughout the, the cross section. Um, we input that in as, a, as the red section here, the hot section in the center. That was where all of our um, analysis was done for the for the spalling because of the the the, the loading frame uh, vice beams that we had we had a cooling condition at the top and the bottom so we just kept those at ambient for the mechanical analysis uh, but keep in mind that all all of our spalling stuff is done at the center point um, so it's all hot section related we were just trying to mimic the uh, the appropriate mechanical analysis output by by using those cool sections um, here here's our, our temperature um, profile so so when we're looking at these we have distance from the heated face going you know into the page to the left into the page to the right is the time history so you end up with surfaces on here i've indicated the um, the spall prediction is is located in, in red in each one of these plots but i'm showing the temperature here compressive capacity reduction, the tensile capacity reduction. Down here on the lower left is our mechanical stress. Uh, the spike you see there is the steel layer. Um, uh, we have the, the pore pressure there. Uh, remember that we're limiting that by the, the temperature reduced tensile capacity each, each one of those fibers. That's why it drops precipitately off to, to zero. And then on the bottom right is our secant modulus. Again, the, the spike you see there is the, um, the steel layer. Um, here, here are them again uh, with very selected time um, stamps. So zero seconds, so right at, at the initiation of heat uh, exposure, 90 seconds from heat exposure, 150 seconds from heat exposure, and then the spalling uh, correctly predicted at, at 230 seconds there, uh, shown in red. Um, I've also put the experimental spall depth on there for reference, but again, we're showing temperature of the upper left, compressive capacity in the upper middle, upper right is the tensile capacity uh, reduction. Uh, the mechanical stresses on the lower left. Again, you can see that softening begins. The 150 second one, the dashed line there is showing you that we're starting to get softening on those outer fibers. And the spalling condition um, also has that, that, uh, that softening condition. And we found that in all of the specimens that we had spalling uh, uh, analysis done for is that that softening condition always occurred. Um, however, all of the concrete always stayed within the elastic region, just what we have with the stress strain profile uh, here is that it's flattening. As the temperature is rising, we start to flatten that stress strain curve out. And we end up having a, a point where we have elongation that's enough, but the, the, the amount of stress it can actually handle um, reduces. And that's how we get that softening on there. Uh, also that uh, the, the lower right hand for the secant modulus there, we see that the, the stiffness in that, in that the, those outer fibers is dropping off almost immediately after heating is applied uh, and it's quite, quite steep. Um, so here I'm showing that zukov lu equation uh, comparison. So the gray is the tensile capacity. The red is that the summation of those forces. 
or the summation of those stresses in comparison, we see that we have like seven peaks there. Um, and so that's kind of where we get into that mechanical analysis. We need to be able to parse out which one of those is actually spalling behavior and which one uh, is not. So the stabilizing, destabilizing conditions is what we start to evaluate after that. So, so he, he, here's the numerical output for each one of those, those specimens. Um, uh, the induced moment, that destabilizing moment is shown here with a negative value. So if our induced moment is negative, it, uh, it, it's indicative of, a, of that spalling condition. Uh, destabilizing spalling condition. The average stress to capacity ratio, we found that needed to be about 10% average across the spalling uh, uh, region. And then the other little caveat that I haven't discussed earlier is that the spalling depth needs to be greater than 7.9 millimeters. And in effect, what we're doing with this is because we've made this gross simplification on the, on the pore pressure development, um, what we're doing with, with this threshold is we're, we're stating that we're not accounting for exhaust of the, of the pore pressure, and we, we need a little bit of, of distance uh, into the cross-section to be able to collect enough water to really get to that saturated vapor pressure um, development. And, and we found from our experimentation under this heating regime that, that it needed to be greater than the 7.9 millimeters. So kind of looking at these, um, our induced moment is, is not met. We don't have destabilizing moment on the first two peaks, and then the first five also don't have that spall depth that we need. The first time that we get all of those things things satisfied um, is at that 230 um, second um, heat duration mark, uh, which lines up with that 228 seconds. And then we have a depth of 9.5 millimeters as opposed to 10. So, so here's our validation set. We had seven specimens on that. The one I just walked through is the first row here. Um, we duplicated a very similar axial load uh, specimen on uh, the second row. Um, the two in yellow here, Oh, and I also wanted to kind of point out the time error and the depth error. So we had two seconds um, late and a half a millimeter um, sh shallow on that on that validation set. Uh, likewise, for the similarly loaded condition, uh, it's four seconds early and a uh, one and uh, one and a half millimeters of depth error. The, the two in yellow here, this was a reduced axial load case. So we, we dropped that 14% uh, to 16% uh, nominal F prime C axial load. We dropped it down to just restraining it at 3% and 1%. Um, both of those did not spall in, in our experimentation with the same uh, heat flux exposure. The, the model correctly predicts that those do not spall. The, the row here in red is an artificially reduced moisture condition. We placed one of these specimens in an oven at 105 degrees plus or minus five degrees C for three weeks. Um, and we couldn't get any moisture readout on those. It did not spall. And likewise, our, our prediction model did so. The two in blue here are a reduced um, heat flux application. So rather than being somewhere around 85% of EAS, ASTM E1529, these are closer to about 65% ASTM E1529. We can see that we accurately predicted the no spalling condition. However, the uh, slightly higher moisture con content um, specimen in there. Uh, we were 114 seconds early and 5.5 millimeters shallow on this. And, and again, this is going back to the weakness in this particular methodology is that we're over accounting for that pore pressure stress. So when we have a, a lower heating regime, we're not able to develop that, that saturated vapor pressure as early or as, as shallow. Um, and it takes longer to, to develop it into this. So it would have been deeper and, and, um, and at a later date or a later time, a later uh, heat duration timestamp. So while it's not perfect, um, this, this gives a pretty good uh, estimation on how to, how to predict the, this behavior uh, within, within certain limitations. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge that this was funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, it was funded through the U.S. Transportation Center for Underground Transportation Infrastructure hosted by the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, my dissertation advisors there, the, the other researchers that have worked on this are listed. And at that, if we have time for questions, we can do that. I was just wondering about why there's no Axial forces, I mean, you end up with about 15% of Yeah, we were just, so, so you were asking why the low axial load. So, so 14% you, you, you feel is, is of nominal F prime C is too low. Uh, we, we were trying to keep it in the region of what we would see for um, serviceability. Um, so, so something that, that wouldn't be like a, a design load um, for it, but something that you would, you would typically see kind of in, in practice. We went up to 30% uh, nominal F prime C on a couple of samples, and we just got spalling, you know, really similar time durations. Um, so there, so there wasn't any reason to kind of go further with that. But by reducing it, when we took it down to that restraining 1% or 3%, it turned off the spalling mechanism. Thank you.